Great. A very warm welcome to everyone who's joining us this afternoon for this in the latest in our series of Agilisys webinars. Um, hopefully everyone will manage to get in in fairly short order, frantically working in the background, making sure that we admit everyone uh, from the lobby so that everyone can participate with us this afternoon. Um, we expect a good, good turnout as well. We've got um, uh, nearly 90 registered uh, for the session this afternoon, so fantastic to be joined by so many people from uh, across the country. Um, let me just say a few words of kind of orientation and introduction to get us going then. Hopefully you can see uh, slides up on the screen in front of you. Our theme for today is road safety, what works and what doesn't work, part two. So if you've just dropped into the conversation, you've missed the opening salvos uh, of this debate that has been inspired by a report from the Global Road Safety Facility at the World Bank uh, and which has sought to set some direction in terms of road safety interventions, identifying those which have the highest level of evidence behind them, supporting them as being effective, but also identifying some of those which don't. And what we uh, in the last session did, I was hosted by my colleague Richard Owen, uh, was to explore particularly the what does work. Um, and we decided, or someone decided, that I should get the task of doing the what doesn't work. Not quite sure how I drew that sh that straw. Um, but uh, but actually what we wanted to do is, is to take a, uh, a, a, a sort of investigative look, I suppose, at the what doesn't work to really understand why certain interventions might not have been recognised within that report as having the same validity as others and to understand what therefore we as a community should be looking to do about that to address any deficit um, and to ensure that actually uh, we can uh, deliver the best impact for road safety that's possible as we go forward. I'm delighted to say that this afternoon I'm joined by three great um, uh, panellists. So uh, my colleague Tanya Fosdick from Agilisys, our research director, is with us. Uh, Darren Dival from uh, D. Dival Consulting, uh, formerly from TRL, who we have worked with on a number of projects, um, is joining us. Uh, and also Holly Hope Smith, um, who is a researcher and uh, specialises in behaviour change and also works with SOMO, who is another partner that we've worked with uh, on various projects. So delighted to have them with us. Um, this afternoon, hopefully, I mean, looking down the list of people who are joining us, I know that quite a lot of you have joined in previously with some of our webinars, so uh, this will be familiar territory to you. Uh, we want this to be an engaging conversation, discussion. We are, you know, we're not shying away from issues and just presenting the stuff that's easy in this webinar series. We're often trying to kind of put out there some of the more challenging aspects of what it means uh, to, to be a progressive road safety profession. Uh, and today's content is, is nothing short of that. I mean, it really is, you know, we, we're going to get into to some fairly sort of thorny issues um, and we want you to be participatory in that. So please do join in, stick your comments in the chat. If you've got a particular question, it would really help just in terms of me being able to scan and see those questions coming through. If you can type question and then enter that in uh, thereafter. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have a really full-blooded conversation here this afternoon. Um, the recording and also presentation slides will be available afterwards. So if you didn't catch all of it or you've had to drop in or drop out, um, or you would like to share with colleagues, then those will all be on the agilisys.co.uk forward slash webinars page um, after this. So probably by tomorrow morning or so, they'll be up and available. Um, so let's just do a, a quick recap then on where we got to so far. So uh, a few weeks ago, we ran a first of these webinars. Uh, we introduced the GRSF report, um, uh, road safety interventions, what works and what doesn't work. And Richard and Tanya were joined by uh, Jess Tarong, by Neil Kinnear, by Brian Lawton and by Matt Staten, who I think is on the call this afternoon. So welcome, Matt, um, to talk about different aspects 
of the uh, the safe system and interventions which have good quality evidence around them and those where the evidence is weaker. We are particularly going to focus on the safe road user pillar um, for this session because I think that when the report first came out was it raised a lot of questions because it was quite critical about a number of areas of road safety work um, that many of us will have been involved with over the years and uh, and is quite challenging about the evidence of effectiveness around those things. So the report presents uh, a number of data tables or a number of sort of summary tables around what can be seen to work in road safety and what doesn't. Um, and so there were some things that were highlighted as being effective, particularly around uh, driver licensing systems that include extensive um, on-road and supervised practice. GDL was uh, unsurprisingly in there. Um, if you just pay for a license um, and there is no assessment of your ability, then that's not effective. Um, uh, increasing the uh, raising the age for driving license eligibility um, and ensuring that there's good quality hazard perception training and testing within that regime those are effective um, but these are some of the things that come out as being not effective and in some cases increasing risk so post license driver and rider education and training and also school-based education and training and then uh, some other things um, so public education and campaigns uh, were identified as being effective where their comprehensive ongoing public education campaigns linked uh, in content and timing with enforcement and penalty regimes um, and then enforcement and then uh, ostensibly the the remaining measures here are to do with kind of enforcement of um, uh, actions um, and increasing uh, primary safety use in vehicles. So that's what we want to talk about is why some of the things that you know many of us will have been engaged with, will have been involved with over the years, seemingly coming out very poorly in the evidence here. Um, and uh, can we understand more about why that is and whether there is actually a uh, a debate to be had about how we can improve um, uh, or whether actually you know we should be sort of stepping away quite clearly from some of those intervention types. Um, one other thing I just wanted to point out was um, this that comes out in the report. So the measures of effectiveness for interventions are largely framed around this model of hierarchy of controls. So um, if you want to control a risk in a population, basically the model argues that the, the easiest thing to do is to eliminate. If you can remove the risk entirely, uh, get rid of the hazard, then obviously you know there will be no danger uh, to um, workers because uh, this is very much based on a sort of health and safety model. Um, maybe you can substitute the risk. You can swap it for something else which has uh, a low, another action or another mode of doing something which has less uh, risk associated with it. Um, maybe actually you can um, introduce some engineering controls, maybe you've got some administrative controls, or can you protect those who would be exposed to the risks introduced by the system? Um, and it seems to me that just reading this report um, that that model as the kind of lens through which we look at effectiveness of interventions might be a bit of a start point for exploring why some things are regarded as being more effective and some things aren't. Not just that it's seen in the casualty data, but obviously there are certain interventions which start higher up the, the, the hierarchy of controls and anything which is behavioural in nature is lower down the hierarchy. Um, so I, let me let me throw that question, sort of reframe that as a bit of a question for um, uh, for the others. Um, I mean, what do you think of my assertion? Is it is it reasonable to to assert that actually when you start with a model like this, um, and we can talk about whether it's you know that's an appropriate lens for for sort of thinking about uh, safe road use, that anything which is behavioural in nature is going to find us at the lower end of 
the hierarchy um, and is or is there anything that we can do about that if we're dealing with um, stuff that is more behavioral in nature who'd like to jump in don't all wait for one another go on darren <laughs> okay cool thank you uh, uh, i was assuming you were talking to me on ollie <laughs> um yeah i mean it's it's interesting isn't it because <clears throat> this this type of model um, reinforces uh, the importance of physical infrastructure or physically doing something to the environment um, that, that is the the most important factor um, certainly to me anyway uh, and, and and I ask myself you know what why is that uh, and and again we can look in the we can look at the report and think about the recommendations and the suggestions that have been made about what does work and what does not work and obviously infrastructure plays a very big role in what does work but i think with infrastructure historically there's always been a lot of data and information to to build from to understand the effectiveness of it um if we go back as far as um you know i i know and i and i should emphasize this that there is a very big difference i think between education and behavior change models or tools to use you know that one improves knowledge the other one tries to change behavior but there is a link between them but if we go back as far as 2005 we had the rose 25 report about education where uh, it it certainly um stated that um, evaluation was negligible in school education. Um, I do think as an industry we have done better to try to uh, monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of education, but it's still at a very early stage, whereas infrastructure has had a, a long history of um, evaluating its impact on uh, killed and seriously injured road traffic um, uh, casualties. And um, and that's ultimately what this report is is focusing on. It is focusing specifically on what has a direct impact on the reduce the reduction of killed and seriously injured. Um, and if we think about moving from there to campaigns, yes, you're ab you're right, and and the, and the report is right that coupled with things like you know other disciplines like enforcement, there is a benefit a certain benefit and a maximization of the um of the results of that type of approach of undertaking campaigns that um, are linked with changing behavior or amending behavior and um i think if i remember rightly um you know coupled with enforcement i think research suggests that that's an additional nine to sixteen percent uh, increase of the of the benefit by uh, by using those together so um, but it's still, again, very new in terms of, um, you know, psychology, behaviour change science is still relatively new. Uh, education, monitoring, evaluation is very, very new and we are improving. But the historical perspective um, and data and availability to understand the impact of um, infrastructure is much greater than where we are with the others. So it doesn't surprise me that using a tool like this hierarchy would suggest uh, and, and affirm the fact that um, you know those types of measures physically removing something or physically changing uh, changing the, uh, the infrastructure to to get rid of the hazard if you want to or substitute the hazard that that would come out on top in this particular model um, the last thing i would say on that before i, I uh, move on would be just to say that you know whilst the report does talk about the direct and link us to the direct impact and uh, benefits of reducing casualties um, i do think that the education and the behavior change interventions still do have a very clear indirect and supporting role to play in the reduction of killed and seriously injured as well Right, that's certainly something that we're going to come on to um, in a little bit. Holly, you look like you're ready to to come in and make yeah. some. I think that's I think I think I agree with pretty much everything that um, Darren was saying. Um, I think that when we're talking about education and um, road safety, I think there's two things to think about. Um, where there is a clear knowledge gap, then there is import it's important to educate. So I think that um, uh, the work that I do with SOMA, we very much take a diagnostic approach. So I think that um, behavioural science in particular is most effective when it's targeted very specifically at the right problem. 
you identify a behavior which you think you can make a make a change to um and in clearly if you're in a situation where um the most effective thing to do would be to physically remove the hazard. I don't know what that would be in in a, any particular scenario, whether that's even a realistic possibility. I think the less you can actually apply some of the things which have seemed to be most effective, like elimination, substitution, engineering controls, um, the less they are a, a reality in a given situation, then things that are will optimise other behaviours, are, are, that's when behavioural science really comes into the fore. And I also would like to say that I think that you can use um, certain uh, techniques that are within behavioural science, methods of behaviour change, when you are trying to design road safety programmes, because there are ways that you can improve education campaigns, particularly for children, which involve modelling behaviours um, and actually have a, a more uh, immersive than simply being given a leaflet, which are actually going to help children to remember what they should be doing, to practice what they should be doing, which means that they're, that's reducing the intention action gap. So when they're out in the real world, they're more likely to behave in a safe way. Because I did see from the evidence that that seemed to be where the, where the problem is. But I do think that there are techniques that can be taken, which can actually enhance and improve existing road safety uh, campaigns within schools. And I would also sort of flip that on its head and say, well, we don't know what would happen if we took road safety out of schools in terms of future KSIs. And, you know, we don't have that data. Um, but I would, I would, I wouldn't want to test that hypothesis myself. So that would be the other thing I would like to sort of sort of flip on its head. I don't think that we should be removing information uh, in schools about road safety. That seems to me, even if it's very difficult to show that it has an effect, it seems counterintuitive to remove it altogether. Yeah, sure. Um, or at least if you're going to, presumably you'd want to do it in a very controlled way uh, so that we could genuinely develop the evidence base around the, the effect of that. Um, Tanya, did you want to come in here? Um, just that I think this model in a way makes um, the road user part of the safe system a poor relation um, because it's not making, you know, we, we concentrate so much on safe speed, safe vehicles, safe infrastructure based on something like this. And we assume that safe road use will follow. And it's almost setting up behavior change and safe road use to fail by saying it is it is at the bottom of this triangle. It is the afterthought. And actually, as Holly's just said, we're, as we're designing infrastructure, we need to think about the behavior change, the, the road use within that. It, it needs to be a collective rather than setting one pillar up against the other. OK, so that leads us really nicely into something that I wanted to pick up on, which was something that Neil said in um, the last uh, session that we had on this a couple of weeks ago, um, which is, I mean, he was drawing a distinction between a sort of safe system approach and the traditional three E's approach of um, enforcement, education and engineering. Um, and he said the difference between change, it's the difference between changing the user of the system and designing the system to fit the user. Um, and I, I just wondered what, you know, uh, you guys think about the, the sort of, have we still got a fundamental issue uh, to grapple with about um, the role of people in the system um, that, that we don't have a truly holistic safe system view when actually what we're trying to do is kind of in a sense eliminate the points of failure from the system i.e get get people out of the way and and the system works just fine whether actually what we need is a slightly different perspective on the safe system that is human centered puts people very much at the heart of the system and then builds a resilient system around it um, and you know obviously Many of our road systems, you know, they've been in development for um, uh, well over a century um, and it's very hard to kind of retrofit that. But I'm interested in your views on the degree to which, you know, we've, we've, we've genuinely got the order right and whether we've got people at the heart of the system. Go on, um, yeah, I, th I think that um, when when the safe system was becoming a little more uh, prominent within the UK, 
Uh, obviously, this document and, and some of the other in initiatives that have gone on in, um, in the past have been uh, quite uh, centred on improvement in low middle income countries. Um, but actually, the UK uh, has has a role to play as well. When we're talking about uh, that, and it first came about, you know, there was references to um, <clears throat> lots of comments that were made. Sorry, my lights in my room have just gone down. Um, that, um, that, that although we were implementing a safe system, everybody felt that I went to a conference actually that that, that, that said uh, there were people presenting saying, yeah, we, we're developing a safe system because we are delivering all of these initiatives uh, and it's all based on data. Uh, and, and when they listed the initiatives, they were all infrastructure ones, but they felt it was part of the safe system simply because they got data for that. But the reason that they hadn't integrated around uh, around anything else or the, the other components of the safe system is because there was a lack of data for that. And that's, that's again, coming back to this uh, lack of information, lack of data and what's required <clears throat> um, to be able to implement a safe system. If we don't know about the user, uh, we can't have anything really that's focused on the user, can we? If we only know about the infrastructure and the, and the data that's telling us where there's a crash or uh, where there's a particular uh, hotspot or something like that, then we can't focus on the user. But the safe system is intended to focus on the user to reduce the risk to them. So, um, uh, you know, we, we, we've really got to start thinking a little bit more about what we need to know about the user. Um, in a discussion in the meeting today, we've talked about the need to involve more women in the design of road infrastructure because their needs are different. Um, and, uh, and and the fact that, uh, um, sorry, my, my lights have gone out, so I'll, I'll stop there for a second. I think you, you know <laughs> the sort of direction I'm going at the moment. Um, but, but, you know, we need to know more. There's, there's more data out there, there's more information out there other than hotspot data or collision data that can tell us more about the needs of these individuals or these road users that can then help us to guide future road safety interventions which are around the whole system and focused on the user, not on a particular intervention or component. Brilliant. We should have done this on Halloween, Darren. You would have that would have been a perfect effect just to drop on you at uh, that moment. Um, brilliant. Uh, Holly, Tanya, did either of you want to come in on this? Um, from my point of view, I think following on quite nicely is the project that Holly and I are working on right now, understanding the needs of the user. Um, we are working or have been working in Liverpool and Hull looking at um, adult pedestrians and and crossing behaviours and the infrastructure is perfect for, I don't know, probably 90% of the road users, but actually undertaking the, uh, there are still very large um, collision hotspots at these locations because it's not working for certain subsets of them. And yeah, we had to perform the behavioural diagnosis, trying to understand what was going on. Um, and actually, yeah, we uncovered some really interesting findings about the nighttime economy and the behaviour of certain people within those circumstances. So we couldn't change the crossing for it's for 90% of the users, the daytime in environment was perfectly safe. Um, but we needed to think about how we could work around those particular road users who were at heightened risk in, at nighttime. I don't know if Holly's got anything to add to, add to that. Yeah, no, we and and um, I do think that this, when we're talking about evaluating user needs, I think it takes different approaches. Um, I mean, we basically uh, immersed ourselves in those settings at the times when the risk was highest. So it's it's an iterative approach. Our first step was to analyse, um, you know, Stats 19 data to identify where risk was, and then we actually went to those locations and and viewed them and experienced what what people were doing in that area and what kinds of people were there and what kinds of behaviors we were seeing and um, you know we, we quickly realized that at night the puffin the smart puffin crossing we were viewing was just not not noticeable because there was so much else going on in the environment it was um, a really busy place with loud music bright lights lots and lots of um, you know, noise from the crowds of people walking from one pub to another pub to another club to, you know, wherever they were going next. And that's where they were focused, really, they were focused on having fun. They were focused on um, where they could have their next drink, really, more far more than where's the safe place to cross this road. 
And because they were inebriated, their inhibitions um, were lowered. And we already know there's a, there's a huge amount of data which already tells us what alcohol and drugs can do to the brain and um, perception of risk. Um, these are also predominantly with very young people. We know that young people's perception of risk is also quite distinct from older people. So these are certain characteristics that you can start building in to build a picture of the persona, really, of the person who's using that location at that time. And um, taking a behavioural science approach, we're like, we have, to, we have to try and cut through this. So that's what we did. We attempted to, create a, um, to enhance the existing crossing to make it safer for those users at that time. And um, separately, there probably isn't time to go into it now, but we created a separate design suited for daytime crossings, where, um, which was completely different because it had to serve a completely different purpose. We took the same approach. And crucially, um, the, you know, we're collecting, crucially we're collecting hard data on this. So the, when we finally get to the end of this trial, we're going to be comparing changes specifically in pedestrian behaviour to see if we've had an Im impact. And we're doing that in a formal way. So, um, and that will strengthen the evidence base around how you can, um, um, you, how you can make small changes in environment and make a small change in uh, a large number of people's behaviour, which hopefully will improve safety overall, to be, to, to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be, to be determined in that, but I think that raises a really important question. Oh, I, I probably ought to mention Peter Hellings would like us to refer to the four E's, um, including encouragement. I've heard it extended to the seven E's. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, periodically changes how many E's we try and get in there in my time in road safety anyway. Um, but uh, but actually where Holly was taking us, I think, was, was a really interesting sort of segue. Um, in the report um, from GRSF, it says... Uh, it deals with road safety management quite separately. It says road safety management is a key enabler for delivery of safety interventions. The approaches used to manage road safety are less suited to empirical evaluation. Um, uh, interested in your views on that, but 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 more more generally, I suppose, um, should we have different? Um, standards of evidence or different types of evidence that are acceptable and and actually necessary to establish the validity of different approaches um, rather than looking you know as, as essentially Darren was taking us down as you know if, if we've got a slightly sort of binary view on well the only way to um, to to evaluate um, effective outcomes is crash data and nothing else um, will will meet the mark that leaves us with a fairly poor toolkit in terms of being able to understand the effectiveness of, of what's happening. So, um, yeah, interested in your views on that, Tanya. Um, I think road safety educators are, are almost stuck in between a rock and a hard place because there is the your evaluations are not robust enough um, versus they're almost impossible to do, so don't bother. And and I think, you know, the, where do they sit? Um, when I did the RAC Foundation work a couple of years ago, um, we, we went out and asked people, you know, how much they were evaluating their educational schemes, how many were using behaviour change theories, and only a, about a quarter of them were, because it's incredibly difficult to do, um, and especially at a local level, on a scheme where there are, you know, when you're educating, there's so much noise. So I, th I think you're right. Uh, it's it's really difficult to expect the same level of evidence as you would for putting in a new roundabout, for example, where you can take out some of that noise. Um, what we do need to encourage, though, is the best possible way of collecting the data um, as being as strong as we possibly can within those constraints. And I think understanding the limitations and recognising them, so being quite clear about where the restrictions are, where the limitations are when we're when we're evaluating education. Um, let me just come back on that then. I mean, so obviously, you know, what you're talking about there is, you know, that that challenge that, oh, well, it's actually quite hard. And for many programmes, they never achieve sufficient scale to do yeah. good quality and robust evaluation. Actually, is that something that we need to grapple with, that we should stop doing small scale programmes that don't have don't stand a hope of being able to produce the quality of evaluation that 
that any of us would be able to hang our hat on. So actually only doing things on a kind of um, regional or subnational level, you know, in, in fairly substantial projects is one of the things that we we just have to acknowledge and embrace. I think so in terms of evaluating whether or not um, delivering at a local level your your version of whatever that educational scheme might be, but but certainly coming together to get a robust um, sample size using strong methodologies, um, looking over a longer period of time. These can't be done at a local level to any strong degree. Um, so yes, I think there is a need for the sector to join together and say, come on, right, this one intervention, we've all got a very similar flavour of this. Let's pull together and evaluate. Darren, you look like you want to come in here. Yeah, yeah, just, just really to uh, confirm some of what um, Tanya said, but also, you know, we've got to st we've got to stop thinking that education has to only monitor and evaluate itself. This is a safe system approach we're implementing, and you know, in the guidance it says, you know, do do education and behaviour change with with enforcement. So you've got two components or two actors, if you like, within the safe road user uh, component of the safe system. So the different actors working together, we've got to start thinking that um, when we are implementing a scheme that might involve infrastructure or vehicle safety or speed reduction, that actually there is an education and a behaviour change component with it. And therefore the scheme as a whole is evaluated, of which there's there therefore more data, um, probably uh, allows for a more robust evaluation. And we monitor and evaluate the scheme or the system as a whole, rather than thinking that one component or one actor has to evaluate itself and prove that it does something. Um, the other thing I would say about the education and the you know, small scale schemes is that is that we know we do have our evaluation. In fact, the, the document also uh, recognises this, as did Blair Turner in the uh, Global Road Safety Facility presentation of this document that there are education schemes that are proven to actually do exactly what it set out to do, which have had a uh, an improvement in road safety, Mes not necessarily the direct, as was evaluated here, direct impact on KSIs, but has a role to play and a proven role to play. What I think we need to do is we need to harness those over the places that they are, that that scheme is Im implemented rather than thinking you know, just about one particular area, for example, you know, if we it, or we delivered it in three schools in Birmingham, um, well, great, OK, but did we deliver it in three in Birmingham and 10 in Edinburgh and six in, um, you know, uh, Aylesbury or something like that, you know, and actually say that this scheme itself as an education initiative is effective and we can prove that and build our case around that and our sample size around that because we should as an industry be delivering and focusing on the implementation of initiatives that have proven already to be effective and then we get a standardized approach across the UK and other countries as well. Okay let me just um, ask, ask you a further question on that so um, I, I really like the idea of us evaluating the scheme as a whole. Um, I suspect that um, we will inevitably, even if even if we choose to do that, um, we will inevitably end up in arguments about, yeah, but what really made the difference? Was it, you know, was it the engineering measures that were implemented? Was it the enforcement measures? Um, are, are you content that we are actually, even if we do evaluate schemes as a whole, um, that we're willing to take whole scheme performance or actually we'd want to get under the skin of that and understand what the active ingredients are? Because actually that if we could adjust that, we could adjust the dosage of that, we might actually find that that scheme could be even more effective or we had some counterproductive effects um, that were introduced by a different element of it. There, there is always a risk that one might be more effective than others, but it depends on what it is that you're actually evaluating, isn't it? You know, if we, we talked earlier about if we're all re always reliant on crash and casualty data, then you know what, education is probably not the best metric for that. Um, if we want to say, um, like we have done and is recognised in this document about, you know, education and behaviour change campaigns mixed with and working alongside enforcement has a 9 to 16 um, uh, percent uh, uh, increase in effectiveness, then 
um, it demonstrates the importance of having those working together. Uh, and and to set, to suggest, uh, just coming back to the first thing you said there, was that, um, you know, to, to suggest that we all ought to assess these interventions independently is not an implementation of the approach and the principles behind the safe system. We are all working together as actors contributing towards what reduces the risk to the human um, uh, road user. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and unless we change our mindset to recognise that we're all working together, we will all continue to work in silos, evaluate in silos and continually, continually criticise the ones that don't quite make the right results that we were expecting or wanted to get to. OK, I, I could make an argument for why my point was still valid, um, but uh, I'm not going to. I'm going to move over to Holly and because uh, uh, she looked like she wanted to come in here. Yeah, I, I was just going to say there are two things, really, that perhaps um, if you're evaluating um, education and um, one, I think, is you want to evaluate the extent to which it was implemented, which is, I think is a really important step um, when you're designing any, any intervention which you want to um, uh, that you want to demonstrate um, might um, make make people safer within any system. I think you need to be able to demonstrate that it was implemented as it was intended, because some there could be a huge amount of variation across the country as to what extent it is implemented, implemented and maintained over time, and that that could be quite important to be capturing in a formal way within the framework. And second, I would say that. Um, there's going to be a real variation across the country in terms if you're thinking specifically about education and if you're wanting to show changes in knowledge, which is ultimately what, what an education programme would do, um, there's going to be variation in baseline levels of knowledge. And quite often when it comes to when you want to change road safety behaviours, people's knowledge of what they should do is actually quite good. So it's very, very difficult to show that your education campaign has changed levels of knowledge because the base level of knowledge was already pretty good. The issue is that they're not actually acting in the in the particular situation in the way they know they should be. So people know what's expected in a lot of circumstances. Um, they know what the desirable thing to do is. They know what's the safest thing for them personally and those around them, and yet they still don't do it. And that is why behaviour change increasingly, I think, is becoming important within road safety, because that's trying to address some of those those slightly more rational things that humans do. Um, but I, but I, I think, so that's the only other thing I would add, which makes it more challenging to show that education um, is, is effective. However, um, I would say that, that if you take a more diagnostic approach and identify areas where people really don't understand what they should be doing, then I would imagine that those would be areas where you'd show that education is having an effect in a, in a, in a positive way. Okay. I, I think that leads us quite nicely into the question that Matt's um, uh, posed to us, um, uh, because I think, you know, um, we're often talking about education, but actually, you know, we're trying to, I think we're trying to understand how we um, embrace behavioural solutions uh, or behavioural interventions across the piece, um, and that's wider than just the effect of education. Um, but Matt said, should we be talking more about the underpinning models supporting behavioural science uh, education work, none of which draw a straight line between knowledge and casualty reduction. Um, I think this this kind of picks up some of the, the thread of what you were just uh, saying, Holly, um, that it's not just I learn, therefore I do. Um, actually, our, the human behavioural system is a much more complex beast than that, um, fraught with all sorts of um, uh, ir irrational responses to to a whole variety of stimuli um, and therefore actually we need behavioral models that work or or are much more attuned to the effect we're trying to have um, i was thinking i might bring tanya in here because obviously this is one of the things you know reflecting what holly just said about you know behavioral intention and knowledge can be fantastic but actually that doesn't necessarily result in behavioural actions that are consistent um, and that's some of the stuff that I know you've looked at in quite a lot of detail with particularly younger road users. Yeah I mean this is a real bugbear of mine to be fair um, so I think we going back to the RSC foundation work um, firstly behavioural models were often not used so you're designing an education intervention not really knowing what you're trying to achieve is this about 
increasing knowledge when knowledge is often um, really good, as Holly says? Or is it about changing social norms or improving attitudes or um, prompting behaviours in different ways? And until we understand that problem, then how do you how do you design an educational intervention that's going to be effective? Um, and I think we too often end up then, if we do use a model, go to the same old, same old. So the theory of planned behaviour is used too often, as is the TTM. And I think, yeah, kind of going back to our adult pedestrians, thinking about pre-contemplation and contemplation, et cetera, when it comes to a, a drunk guy trying to cross the road, is it's farcical. Um, and and similarly with with young drivers, young people, and and the theory of planned behaviour, we had a bit of epiphany, an epiphany a few years ago, didn't we? Where we were looking at um, trying to evaluate young driver schemes using the theory of planned behaviour, and the results we were getting were nonsense. Um, knowledge was really positive, intentions were really positive, and the model just wasn't working. Um, and this is where we looked more broadly and found the prototype willingness model, which is about, which is aimed at adolescents. It's it's about their irrational, spontaneous behaviour. And suddenly, when you're starting to measure um, effectiveness along those lines using um, that model and the measures which which um, correlate with it, the results then therefore make sense. And and I, I think we just really need to really be careful about. A, what, what model we're using when designing and also what model we're using when we're evaluating because time and again I'm still seeing evaluations where the, the results are not what they ought to be because it's not the right model. Rant over. <laughs> That's all right. You're you're entitled to that one. Um, uh, I, I'm sure. Um, so uh, a couple of other comments that uh, have come in. So Julia has said um, uh, we need to take a whole system approach so that education campaigns not school education are linked to enforcement for example a week of campaigning followed by a period of targeted enforcement there's so much siloed working lots of notable good practice in local areas but we need more uh, joined up collaboration um, that that takes us on quite nicely actually Julia to uh, one of the uh, not that one was, let me go to that one um, one of the things that comes out in the report is this whole thing about coefficient effects and I think that's a little bit where some of our conversation is heading um, so they drew out a parallel with seatbelt use in the state of New South Wales in Australia um, where um, campaigning only um, uh, increased seatbelt use by around 20 percent um, but when combined with enforcement that achieved a, uh, a result of around 95% um, compliance. Um, and yeah, I just wonder whether there's, you know, other perspectives that we can sort of draw on that about the way in which we get the system working effectively. I mean, Darren, you've kind of already sort of pushed us in this direction to say, you know, can, can we start with a design that actually involves behavioral intervention alongside engineering alongside enforcement so that we actually have a much more systematic and strategic view on what we are trying to achieve do you want to do you want to speak to that if you want to please unmute because yeah sorry um it, it didn't surprise me you know we we use this example in in the document we could also go to other places for example in in turkey in the province of afon uh, for example there was a big campaign there uh, which was funded by bloomberg to try to increase seatbelt usage which was down as low as 30 percent in some of the road user categories lower than that with others um and within within six months it was up at 70 percent uh, but the governor was involved. There was a big uh, behaviour change and education campaign around that, and that's fantastic. And it went up to 70 percent. Um, but within um, a couple of years after that, because it wasn't enforced after that, it was just a campaign that got it up and they all walked away. And the campaign messages weren't reinforced further than that. It all came tumbling back down again. You know, we need we need um, to have these campaigns, whichever or whatever uh, collaboration of uh, in interventions we uh, uh, and components we we pull together, we need them to be reinforced and continued and uh, sustained along the way. What one thing I've, in terms of infrastructure, I hope this sort of answers a bit from my perspective is that if you change the infrastructure, let's just say outside a school, and we've delivered a, an education and behaviour change program, um, and then all of a sudden. We've got this new unfamiliar 
infrastructure where we may have reallocated row space or put some new safety interventions in. That, from a uh, psychological processing point of view, means that we almost start again. And from the working memory that children and adults are developing, where they see things, they hear things, and then they go through a process of, do I need to stop at, the, uh, stop at the edge of the road? Do I need to press a button? Are there beacon lights? Is it black and white? Are there vehicles coming? All of these different processes, bringing that all into their working memory and trying to get that to transfer over to their long-term memory and using that type of, I'm going to carry on, and yes. using that type of, um, that type of um, uh, model, if you like, to get it into working memory so that they can record it into their um, uh, short term memory when they need to actually use that in that environment when they see it again. If you're putting all that in unfamiliar, unfamiliar infrastructure in place outside of school, whether it's reallocation of road space, whether it's new traffic calming, whether it's new safety interventions of any other sort, you have to educate them how to use it because their processes, what's in their working memory, what's in their long term memory that they need to recall back to work out how to use something, unless it's been used elsewhere and they've been able to chunk what we call chunking that information into so they can call on it and draw on it later on when they come into that similar scenario again. They, they don't know how to use it and therefore the infrastructure in a sense, you could choose a hypothesis that suggests that the new infrastructure increases the risk initially until the education and behaviour change has happened or until, until the adaptation has happened from the road user to figure out what it is that they're supposed to do. Um, and what we will see is that, and, and that's for me why you need to have the collaboration of all of these components and if infrastructure, education, enforcement, behaviour change all need to work together to maximise as the way that it's been described here, then that's exactly what we should be doing. And I think that sometimes we are working far too much in silos, as, as I think um, it was Julia that mentioned silos earlier on. Um, yeah, that's my point. Um, I, I wonder whether actually, Holly, you might have some some perspective on that. I mean, you know, both in terms of uh, psychologically how we respond when, you know, we're engaged with new infrastructure. I mean, presumably that that's something that you thought about quite a bit with sticking, you know, new versions of pedestrian crossings uh, down in Liverpool and Hull. Uh huh. Yeah. So um, I think um, Dan brought up quite an interesting thing that when you change something in the environment, it actually, the, hopefully, um, we are curious about it and we pay more attention to it because it's new. Novelty, novelty is its own stimu stimulus. Um, but uh, and in fact, what you would hope in making some putting something new, so say, uh, let's hypothesize there's a brand new uh, infrastructure embedded in outside of school that it's not as in our study, it's that this was an enhanced, um, although I'm going to draw on this, uh, was an enhanced puffin crossing. So it was a, it wasn't it wasn't a new infrastructure. It was just enhanced to make it more um, salient to the people who were using it. Um, but say this is a brand new in, a brand new um, infrastructure that has never been seen anywhere before. Um, um, I think that Dan's quite right. You might expect in the short term there to be increased risk, not lower risk, because we aren't just thinking about the pedestrian here. We have to think about all road users. How would someone approaching it in a car deal with it? How that I would say the risk comes more from from what's happening with other, with with all the road users. Um, meeting this new infrastructure at the same time and obviously without some preparation some engagement and some prior work um, there could be a huge number of unintended uh, consequences and public um, um, negative opinion about the change they may not like change people often don't like change um, and I um, one thing I have learned lessons learned from doing this existing trial just enhancing puff and crossing so we've just changed how they look um has not been universally liked i mean we are we and so i think that's really important to recognize that um uh, that again you, you even in the context of a temporary change um people have very strong negative opinions you will not be able to please all people all of the time but i think it's very very important that 
um, when uh, if, when you're des designing a new infrastructure or enhancing an existing one, that you do as much engagement work as you can with as many road users as you can, particularly if you know that the consequence of that infrastructure is going to be quite dramatic in terms of, I don't know, traffic flow or, um, or, 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 or movement of a particular road user. If you're prioritising one road user over the other, the road user that's been deprioritized is going to have feelings about it. So I just, I think that th that it's very important, but also I'd like to add that in the terms of the seatbelt example, um, and they've shown nicely how if you layer one intervention over another, you have a greater and greater effect. I do think in the context of um, road safety, which is ultimately about stopping people from being killed, um, uh, or being having life-changing injuries, um, that to a certain extent, because it's a real-world change, whilst we have to work really, really hard to engage with road users to um, educate and ensure that that when it's implemented, it's implemented safely. I think uh, yes, as much of that as we can wrap around it. So uh, to wrap around any kind of solution, as many layers as we can, is important because that overall hopefully is going to save more lives so i think all of that's really important and sometimes while it's important to know which level did which is really nice in the study we can see the, the different um effects for each each layer i think sometimes it's just important to put as many layers on as you can to have as the biggest effect that you can i would say there's lots of questions coming in now Helps if I unmute. Um, so there's a bit of a conversation about the purpose of this session. So just to reiterate what I said at the start, this is very much part two um, of a two part series based around the GRSF Global Road Safety Facility report on what works in road safety and what doesn't. Um, the first session looked very much at what works and the evidence that was um, examined in relation particularly to things like um, infrastructure, safe vehicles, um, and uh, post-crash response. And then what we are trying to pick apart here is the why um, some of the results around the safety performance improvements associated with campaigns, advocacy, education, behavioural initiatives are often poor, or at least the evidence around them seems to be poor. Um, so that's that's what we're trying to get at the heart of in this session, rather than rerunning the session that we did a couple of weeks ago. That is all on the website. Go to agilisys.co.uk forward slash webinars. You can watch it um, and you can email my colleague Richard with all of your questions um, if you'd like to on that one. Um, good. OK, so look, we are coming towards the end of uh, the time that we've got. And I think, you know, one of the things that I just wanted to make sure we came back to was the question of um, evaluation. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the manual, in a sense, takes um, the approach that um, some sorts of interventions are less suited to evaluation than others. That's why it was kind of a bit dismissive about trying to evaluate all of the stuff that was in the road safety management pillar. Um, but I guess, I guess my my question to you as a panel is: Look, how how do we find ourselves in a different place in five years' time? We come back to this conversation in five years' time. Like we don't want to be talking about well, we don't really know about the effect of this, or we don't really know about the effect of that. What what would what would better look like? Um, and uh, so I want you to kind of, you know, kind of cast forward five to 10 years and go, well, actually, you know, it would look like this. And I guess, you know, a lot of what we've dis been discussing is around how we develop the evidence base further. So who wants to go first on what what better would look like and their utopia in five to 10 years time? Uh, choose your time period, Darren. I think it's I think it's quite clear for me. Um, if the best way to understand if uh, something reduces uh, casualties, uh, killed seriously injured casualties, um, then use that as the metric. If something is about increasing knowledge, use that use that as the metric to then evaluate if you're if you're using behavioral change reinforcement get your baseline data for that specific type of intervention if you are 
following through with a safe system approach where you are co-joining and collaborating all of the interventions or sort of say all the components of the safe system together then you have to recognize we have to recognize that each one of those different actors and components within that collaborative approach will have their own evaluation effective evaluation methodologies that demonstrate if certain things are done and from that report from that data then you usually you then produce a report which demonstrates the overall effectiveness of the scheme but having the individual components so for, for example doing it simplistically you may look at um, infrastructure have we had at this particular site a reduction in KSIs? You may see the education part of that because it was close or it was on a corridor with lots of schools. Have we incre increased knowledge through doing a knowledge attitudes practices survey pre, during, post, post again? Um, uh, if we're doing behaviour change, you know, what were the behaviours at the start? What were the behaviours during and what after? And, and just to accept that the scheme as a whole is in a safe system requires different methodologies based on the different components of it. And as soon as we get to that, we can then see much more of a holistic, but also component based evaluation um, approach. Okay. Tanya. Okay, well, otherwise known in our organization as the queen of evaluation, so um, she better have a good answer on this one. <laughs> well, I, I agree with everything Darren has just said. Um, I think, however, it's just coming back to those models and thinking about um, what in the behavior change area we are trying to achieve. So, yes, it's incredibly difficult to measure casualty reduction directly from training and education, but if we're not using the right models and, and being really clear about what we're measuring, there is a danger of doing harm. And we've seen that for many years with the use of fear appeal in road safety education with young people. Um, we've seen that with skid pan training. So I think it's just a case of, um, yes, acknowledging what we can measure where and when, but let's be robust in what we're doing when we're looking at the, evaluate, the education arm of it um, so that it's as good quality as we can possibly get. Great. Uh, Holly. Um, well, I was thinking in five years time, um, what would be really wonderful is if there was more collaboration between um, regions and if there was a commitment to um, sharing of data so that over time data is increasing. We have larger amounts of data from large from, from wider ranges of the UK. Um, which would start to build an evidence base which would show um, differences between regions, differences between rates, but also would be capturing other important information about road density or all different types about the roads and the infrastructure that's in place, because obviously that's going to change how effectiveness, how effective a road safety campaign is going to be. I mean, being realistic, if you live in a very dangerous area, it doesn't matter how well educated you are if the re if the quality of the area you live in is very poor. And I would just just one final point on that is I don't think what we talked about enough is the very wide range in deprivation that it still exists in the United Kingdom. And I know we are a higher income country, but there is a huge variation in deprivation. And I do think that that is an important factor that we don't address, which really does determine how safe your roads are. If you live in a very, very poor area, the quality of the roads that you have to traverse, the number of barriers that are in your way so you can't see where you're going, the, you know, the, the scarcity of safe crossing places and safe places to park your car I mean it's just an altogether more dangerous environment and far more likely for a collision to occur and whilst you know and I do think that's very important when when we when we look at this in the round and I think if we started working more collaboratively we'll be able to pick up those nuances and then that would give us far more information on what we should be doing in the future. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. It was one of the things that had we had a bit more time, you know, we, we would have um, double clicked on was the the degree to which this evidence, which is, you know, being promoted as being applicable in low middle income countries, the degree to which it's transferable to high in, high income countries. But I think as um, Holly has, has very uh, eruditely 
explained there. Um, actually, just because we're a high income country doesn't mean that there aren't issues of, of, of deprivation and it doesn't mean that all of our infrastructure is up to scratch. So therefore, there are still, you know, significant areas of investment required there. Um, I'm very conscious that we have hit three o'clock um, and so uh, we have reached the end of our time together. I, this is a conversation that um, I would be happy to continue well beyond um, the uh, the appointed time but um, uh, we don't wish to overstay our welcome and want to make sure that you can get on with the rest of your afternoon. Let me just finish uh, by introducing some of the content that's still to come. Um, so we've got several webinars still coming up over the next few weeks. Um, on Monday the 15th, next Monday, um, we're going to be running a session with a variety of the authors from the Safe Roads for All report uh, that was published by Break on behalf of a consortium of um, uh, of uh, experts really pushing the government agenda uh, in relation to, to the forthcoming road safety strategy to say how that should look, how it should be a much more integrated approach to safety, sustainability uh, and healthy mobility. Um, so we're going to be talking through that next week. Also next week, we've got the launch of the GB Road Safety Performance Index. Uh, that's a project that's been sponsored by the Towards Zero Foundation uh, and which will be accompanied by a new data tool to highlight uh, road safety performance as we look back over the last decade and as we look forward to trying to achieve the goal of 50 by 30 as well. Um, so there will be insights specific to your local area, whether you're a police force or a local authority. Uh, well worth tuning in for that. That's next Thursday. Um, then we've got uh, another one of these kind of thorny issues to grapple with. We're going to be looking at challenges of the say system on the 23rd of November, uh, where we're going to un, un sort of pick apart another couple of the, the sort of difficult things about the safe system, uh, maybe in terms of its its measurement or you know how we view it and how we got a, a genuinely mature perspective on how to do safe system. Uh, and then as we get hit the end of November and into December, we've got a, a new sort of mini series on older mobility. And that starts on the 30th of November with the launch of the Older Drivers Task Force report, where we'll be joined by uh, various members of the Older Driver Task Force, including the chair, uh, John Plowman, and members of the Road Safety Foundation to launch that report uh, here on one of these webinars. So um, great to have those in the pipeline and coming up over the next few weeks. Um, hope you can join us for them. Just go to the website, agilisys.co.uk, click on webinars, and you can register for those. Uh, as I said, all of the recordings and presentations are posted online um, sort of uh, within 24 hours or so. Uh, so do go and check those out if there's anything that you've missed. Um, it just remains for me to say enormous uh, thank you to Darren Dival and to Holly Hope Smith um, and to Tanya as well. Um, uh, great to have them with us to uh, to discuss the issues that have been raised by that GRSF report. Um, I hope you found the conversation stimulating and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks very much and goodbye for now.